Okay, hi. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started with today's sessions. I haven't had anybody join me yet here. It's a little past 11. Um, so we'll see uh, if anybody joins us questions live here. Um, so we're on the third unit here. So we're about halfway through. Um, let me remind you, I think I probably mentioned this in the um, um, in the announcement for the week, but um, so do remember that like the the fifth week we're actually done on Thursday. Um, so our fifth week, fifth unit is actually kind of um, a little less time than normal. Um, so you know th this week and next week we're we're gonna have the usual kind of schedule. So we have a written problem set due on Tuesday and a programming assignment due on Thursday, and then I open up uh, a test over the the two chapters. Um, on Friday, Saturday, okay. Um, we'll do that on uh, this this week for chapters uh, uh, five and six over concurrency issues. We'll do that next week over uh, the chapter seven, eight, and eight on memory management and virtual memory. Uh, but then for week five, um, which is over the the chapters nine and ten, which is uh, job scheduling um, uh, materials. Um, at that point, I, I kept everything in the same except the test is open like uh, from Wednesday to Thursday. So you've got both the test and the last test five and the last program assignment five due um, on the same day on that last week of the class. So just keep that in mind. Uh, you might want to try and make certain that you stay uh, um, um, ahead of stuff a little bit so that you can start a little bit early. For that last unit, I, I see that already seven or about half the people that are um, still with the the course here have already gotten assignment three, um, the accepted. So um, that's good. Um, so yeah, I mean, as usual, I'm going to talk about the uh, problem set that's due tomorrow, um, and then the assignment three. Um, I I haven't gotten back assignment two yet for everybody, so I'm going to finish those up today. Um, I think I'm going to talk a little bit about um, uh, running the simulation assignment two first. Um, there is uh, some more detailed discussion for the, the test two written questions uh, posted. I did get test twos evaluated and returned back to everybody. So um, I don't think I'm going to go over those. Um, I didn't have a lot to add. Most people either got it or uh, completely missed it. So, you know, if you got it, then that's fine. If you completely missed it, make certain that you look through the answers um, and um, um, see what it was that I was looking for, especially for the second question about discussing the uh, the uh, made up operating system states and mapping those to our seven state uh, diagram from our uh, um, uh, from our textbook. So. Um, So let me start. Um, so I want to talk about the problem set three. Let me start with that, I think. Let's start with the problem set. Um, um, and I'll just discuss uh, what I'm looking for for this here. Um, and again, we'll see if anybody uh, wants to ask any specific questions here, shows up to ask some things about this. So, um, so we're talking about concurrency issues here um, in this unit, so specifically about mechanisms for dealing with concurrency. Okay, this is all related to the, the second problem set question where we had an example of a concurrency issue where we had two threads trying to increment the global um, um, the global counter, basically, and we had a, a, um, a demonstration of how they could interfere with each other. Technically, that's a type of a race condition that, that we had in that problem. So we'll, we'll come back to that question. Um, and in fact, in my lecture materials, I kind of show using some of the mechanisms that are talked about in um, chapter, um, I guess it's uh, five, uh, uh, five, where we talk about semaphores and things like that. So uh, one of the lecture videos, I kind of show um, really fixing that problem set from uh, last week, that question. So uh, I'm going to talk about that on Wednesday a little bit. Um, but anyway, so um, for this problem set three, um, the first question hopefully should be relatively easy. Um, all I'm looking for is like a list of, of possible interleavings, okay? And I gave you one. Or, um, um, 
So really, this is a valid interleaving, uh, you know, V executes, then W, then X, Y, Z. So that, that represents uh, the, the scheduler scheduling process one. Um, process one executes both of its statements. Um, and then the, um, the scheduler then switches over to, um, um, uh, to dispatch process two, and it executes its three statements, all right? So we get the sequence of interleavings of statement VW followed by XYZ executing in that example, all right? So, um, so, so the thing to understand about that is that um, um, some interleavings are possible and some are not, okay? So for one, all, all the, the statements in one of these processes, um, or, or however you want to think of this, can also think of this as like a function uh, that's running in a thread. So two se th separate threads running inside of our process, running um, function P1 and function P2, right? But the statements within uh, these have to run sequentially. So um, uh, WV XYZ is not a valid interleaving because W can never execute before V, all right? <laughs> So, um, so you have to list all the actual possible interleavings, the ones that could possibly happen, right? So, you know, I mean, it, it could also happen that we uh, schedule P2 to run before P1. So it could be that X runs first instead of V, right? But by interleavings, also remember, th these statements are supposed to be considered atomic, but we can switch between the statement and start running the statements in the other thread or the other uh, process, however you want to think of that, right? So we could execute V first, and then we get interrupted, um, and the operating system um, does a uh, context switch and starts running these statements over here, right? And and we could have switch multiple switches, right? So we could run a statement here and switch over, and then switch back. So so you have to get all those, okay? Um, kind of as an upper bound, there's there's what there's five possible. Um, um, statements here that need to be executed. So every uh, one of your answers is going to have five statements, the, the five letters, V, W, X, Y, Z, in some uh, order, right? So if you know anything about, if you know anything about probability, about counting the number of combinations, um, we know that there's an upper limit. Since there's five, that means I, I can choose any one of these five for the first one. And so I have five possibilities to run first, except except some of these are impossible. I can't choose W to run first before V, but 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 uh, just as an upper bounds, I could choose five. Once I've choose one of the five, then I'd have four left because each one of these definitely only executes once. So um, the an upper bounds of, of of the number of possible interleavings is five times four times three times two times one or five factorial. That's 120, right? But there's there's quite a few less than that than 120. But but um, um, that is an upper bound, right? Um, uh, because, you know, because like V can't run before W, there should be considerably less. So it's somewhere more than one or two. I showed you one or even gave you a pretty big hint for two possible interleaving. So it's more than one or two, but it's a lot less than 120. Um, it's certainly no more than 120. All right. Um, and then for the second question, um, this is we're, we're going to our our um, third assignment this program assignment this week we're going to be implementing the banker's algorithm you know so you should really understand this i have uh, one or two lecture videos about uh, i think just one about doing these deadlock um avoidance and deadlock prevention um and deadlock detection algorithms okay so th there's three separate things um and um i kind of wish that maybe i had or thought to open up my textbook um uh, but just to review a few things in the um, um, the, the lecture videos for this week. Uh, uh, so, so here, the, this this question is mostly from the um, uh, chapter six, right? So, so the semaphores and monitors and the mechanisms of uh, to provide. Uh, you know, the, the 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 ways to implement mechanisms in order to. Um, um, in order to um, 
deal with concurrency issues um, is all in chapter five here. So, so th this builds up uh, on the hardware and software kinds of mechanisms that operating systems give in order to, to deal with the kinds of concurrency issues like we had in our second problems in question. Uh, and then chapter six is then about um, some additional sorts of concurrency issues. So it's it's mostly about deadlocks, okay? So, so we spent a lot of time looking at deadlocks and there's kind of three different ways of dealing with deadlocks in the system. So, so if you, um, if you um, have these four, these three necessary and, and four necessary and sufficient conditions, then deadlocks are still possible, right? So even though you have a mechanism in order to correctly enforce concurrency to make certain that you don't end up with, um, you know, losing um, uh, um, work being done like, like we had with the race condition, right? Um, so, you know, e even if you have like semaphores or monitors or, or things like that, uh, the, those sorts of mechanisms for uh, making certain concurrency works right, you can still have other problems with concurrent uh, processes running concurrently. Uh, so specifically things, deadlock and starvations are always still possibilities, right? So if you have these four conditions um, where the first one is mutual exclusion and that one you pretty much have to support in the system. So this is, this is what these mechanisms are for to enforce mutual exclusion, right? So uh, if you have a semaphore or something uh, equivalent in your system, you can enforce um, a critical section in a code, right? And so for by using a metaphor, we can define a critical section around like an access, like a reader or write to a shared resource, like we did with the, that that variable that we were incrementing in our second problem set, okay? So, so, so these things like sound force monitors are mechanisms in order to support mutual exclusion. And you, you have to have mutual exclusion in order to be able to not have unstable systems, in order to be able to have systems that, that support concurrency correctly and don't get incorrect results, all right? Uh, but if you also allow for processes, concurrent processes to to uh, lock a resource um, and wait for another resource, that's a hold and wait, that's, that's one condition. And you also allow when you've got a, a resource locked and you're holding it, that you can't be forced to give it up. So if you have these three conditions, deadlocks can occur in the system, right? And there's reasons why you should read the textbook, watch my lecture videos, there's reasons why you really usually want to have all these conditions be true for your system for um, performance reasons. You, you, uh, you, you, you really need to support mutual exclusion um, or else concurrent systems won't work correctly, but you also usually wanna allow hold and wait of resources and that resources can't be uh, forcibly returned uh, once they've been locked, so no preemption, right? But if you do allow those, then you can have deadlocks, you can have starvation. Um, uh, these are sufficient, uh, uh, sorry, these are necessary for a deadlock to occur, but they aren't sufficient in and of themselves. So even though you have these three conditions, you're not guaranteed that a deadlock will evolve in the system. So a deadlock will only occur if you end up then having a closed circular chain of hold of resources being held um, in these uh, these resource allocation graphs, um, um, you know, the arrow from the resource to the process represents a, a resource being held or locked. So each one of these processes is has one of the four resources locked and each so each one of those is holding the resource and each one of these is waiting on the um a, a different resource right so this this is the uh, necessary and sufficient condition for a deadlock so none of these processes if we can't preempt if we can't forcibly um make one of these processes unlock one of these resources and if we allow them to wait for a resource to become unlocked before they proceed uh, using each one of these processes need two resources in this particular graph here. Um, so yeah, if we allow those and we end up with a chain that looks like this, they basically you can think of this as like a directed graph that starting at any place, you can get back to where you started from. So if you have such a chain, then there's an actual deadlock in the system, okay? So, um, so I want to talk about the, the, the question, you know, coming back here for our third problem set. Uh, the question for our third problem set is an example of a deadlock avoidance 
um, um, strategy. So there's really, there's, there's two that our, our textbook talks about the um, 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 process initiation denial, um, um, PID or the resource allocation denial, RAD, uh, another name for RAD, uh, deadlock avoidance is the banker's algorithm. Okay? So, but real quickly before that, um, um, you can prevent deadlocks um, completely and, and make certain you understand this. These, these are all three different ways of, if you wanna have a system that supports concurrency, but you want to deal with deadlocks in a more principled way than just allowing them to happen, um, you can prevent them completely, but the way to prevent them is to remove one of those four necessary and sufficient conditions, okay? So it, it, in general, you can't remove, if, if you want to support concurrency, you, you have to have mechanisms that, that enforce mutual exclusion. So that's, you, that you can't really get rid of that necessary and sufficient condition. But you can do things like, for example, um, 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 remove the, the no preemption um, necessary condition, right? So you could do like, you could make it so that uh, a system um, is built in such a way that uh, you can force a process that has a resource locked to unlock it, right? So normally th this, this happens commonly in like database systems. I probably talk about this in the lecture video. So, so often for like database systems, um, um, there's a rollback mechanism. So, so a database system, when it tries to uh, process a transaction in order to like update a row in a database table, um, um, if it detects that um, a deadlock has happened there, it will roll back um, to um, a prior to before the request was started and retry the request. Okay, that, that's kind of that, that's an example of how you can get rid of the preemption. So by by providing a rollback mechanism. So if you do get deadlocked, uh, you release all your resources and restart that transaction to try to do that again. Okay. Um, and um, um, uh, so that th these kind of represent two ends of the scale. So deadlock prevention is very um, conservative. Um, so this has the kind of big performance implications, right? If, if you remove one of those necessary conditions, you, you might, your system might perform, you know, the performance might go down quite a bit. At the end of the, end of the scale, you can just let deadlocks happen um, but but if you still want to do something about them, you might periodically want to do something that that looks through the system and sees if there's a deadlock. Okay, so the deadlock detection basically uh, uh, detects like if there's a circular chain, like I was showing before. If if it sees one, so, so basically for deadlock detection, if you find that there is a deadlock, um, the system might do something as crude as just kill one of the processes this in the deadlock um, and, and start killing processes until the deadlock is no longer in the system, right? So back to deadlock avoidance or the banker's algorithm, this represents kind of an intermediate, okay? So it's not quite as bad in terms of performance as being really conservative like deadlock prevention, uh, but it, um, 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 but it's not as good a performance as the deadlock detection because we're going to try to keep our system in a state so that deadlocks can't um, actually um, form, even though we still have all the, the, the four necessary and sufficient conditions in a system, right? So, so the, the reason why the performance is not so good here is that, the, is that we're going to keep deadlocks from, uh, from happening. We're going to avoid them. But we have to run um, this deadlock avoidance algorithm, the banker's algorithm, or the PID. Basically, the PID is run every time a new process is started, right? Uh, whereas resource allocation now would be run every time uh, a process makes a request to lock a, a new resource or lock a new set of resources, okay? So, um, So the way that the banker's algorithm works, um, and I, you know, I, I go through, I think I go through the textbooks uh, example um, in our lecture videos, is that we define um, the, the state of a system like this, uh, or, or like is shown in our textbook, um, as kind of a set of matrices or vectors, okay? So this completely describes the, the state of the system, um, where, you know, we've got 
four resources that we call A, B, C, D in this problem. Um, the total number of each resource of each type um, is given here. So we've got 12 of A, 7 of B, 5 of C, and 8 of D, all right? So in order to run the resource allocation now or the banker's algorithm, we have to know two pieces of information. We have to know the maximum amount of resources each process claims to need in order to finish its work, okay? So before a process can start, it has to give us this information. So process zero is, is making a contract or making a guarantee that in order to complete, if you give me nine of A, five of B, five of C, and five of D, I can complete my work. As long as I can get those, um, that number of each of those four resources, um, I can finish up what I need to do, right? And that's the maximum claim. Um, but while a process is running, uh, it, can, it can do some work maybe without having everything allocated. So at this time in the system, um, these are what is currently allocated to each process, right? So even though uh, process zero claims it needs nine of A, it currently only has two of A, right? So, but but maybe that, that's all it needs to do some work right now, right? And it has one of B and zero of C and one of D, right? So um, the first question, um, um, you know, so this is the total of each resource we have, but we currently claim that this is the amount available that we have, all right? So you should verify that. How, how do you verify that? Well, um, um, if you take the current allocations, so for example, we've currently got two plus three plus one plus one, which is seven. So, so among the five processes that are running, uh, seven of A is allocated, um, um, but there's 12 total, right? So, so really the, the, the difference between the total and the allocated should be what's available, right? There's 12 total, seven are being used among the processes, so there's five. So, you know, to verify this, you have to show me that, that um, 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 the difference between the total and the current allocations um, matches what the state is available here, right? Um, another matrix that's useful is the need matrix, okay? So um, I'll, real quickly, I'll talk about the banker's algorithm because, um, you know, I'm, I'm spending a little bit of time on this because this is also what we're doing for the um, uh, third programming assignment, right? So we're exactly going to be implementing the, the uh, function to determine if the state is safe or not, right? So it'll, it'll help you a lot to, to implement the program assignment if you completely understand this question and how to um, perform the, the check for a state being safe or not by hand here, as is described in our textbook, right? So the need matrix is simply the difference between what I've currently all got allocated, um, uh, difference between my maximum claim and what I've currently got allocated, okay? So for example, um, process zero again is claiming it needs at most nine, but it currently has two allocated. So that, me that need means that it needs seven more of A to be guaranteed to be able to finish its work. If I gave it seven more of A and gave it um, the rest of what is needed for B, C, and D, it should be able to run do all this work and complete. And then when it's, when it's complete, it could release back all of its allocated resources back to the system for other processes to use, all right? So anyway, the need matrix is simply the difference between the, the, the C and A, the, the maximum claim versus what I've currently got allocated, all right? All right, and then, so what we're going to be implementing in our third um, program assignment is really um, determining whether a state is safe or not, right? So, so the, 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 the way the banker's algorithm works is that uh, a process is going to come in and make a request for some additional resources. Um, so I would update, uh, I would kind of make a, um, um, a proposed new state of what the state would look like if I were to grant those resources. And then I check if that state is safe or not. And if the state is safe, we would go ahead and uh, um, allow those resources, that, that request to be granted. We would grant that request for additional resources. But if the resulting proposed state is not safe, we would deny that request, right? And that, that process would have to, um, I don't know, go to sleep or something um, and then try again later on to, to um, uh, request those resources to see if the system is safe now for it to be allocated those resources, all right? So um, 
if you have the need matrix, um, um, we, we can ask, is any given state safe or not, right? So the, the starting state you're given here, along with the need matrix, specifies the current state of the system. So we can ask, is that state safe or not, okay? So, you know, um, uh, real simply, the way the, the RAD algorithm works is that um, a state is safe if we can find a sequence of processes where if we gave the process all of its needed resources and just let that process run to completion, and then the pro if the process runs to completion, that means that it could release all of its allocated resources back, um, and then we keep doing that, right? If, if we can find a sequence where, where we give each process uh, one by one uh, sequentially, all the resources it needs, it runs to completion, uh, releases those resources, and then we run the next process, right? So if there is a sequence where all the processes run to completion, the state is safe. And if, if, if we can't find such a sequence, then the state is not safe, okay? So to determine if a process's needs can be met, um, um, you, you know, it's, it's easiest if you have that need matrix calculated, right? So, you know, um, again, um, let's just real quickly work on, I don't know, process zero. So, so process zero needs seven of A, uh, four, five, and four. So seven, four, five, four is kind of the need vector for process zero. So um, we can ask, so can process zero's needs be met from what's currently available? And the answer is no immediately because it needs seven of A, but there's only five of A. Right. So anyway, that that's 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 the thing. So so if you do that for all the processes, so, so could process one's needs could be met, or process two, right? So it, then as soon as you find a process whose needs could be met, what you would do is you would simulate running the process to um, completion. Okay. So really, all you would need to do, I mean, it fully, what would happen in a real system is you would allocate its needs, and then it was, and when it's done, you would um, um, deallocate those, return those back to the system. But we can do uh, something slightly simpler because we know that if we just only let that process run, uh, all we have to do is once it's done is, is deallocate what it currently has allocated, right? So if, if process zero actually could run to completion given the current available, we, uh, once, once we simulate it being finished, we would return back its resources to 101. So now available would change from this to be 7434, uh, four, right? And then once we have that new available resources, and we have to keep track of which processes have run to completion, right? So, so you know, um, but we would have an updated number of res available resources and we could um, um, see if another process could now be run to completion with those available, all right? Um, and then finally, because uh, I want to talk a little bit about the um, program assignment, um, there's a very common mistake people make here on, on the, the second part of this. So, so you have to calculate whether a state is safe or not two times, all right? Uh, and I'm going to take off of this because, you know, I'm pretty certain I say this in the lecture video, or if not, you know, I'm, I'm saying explicitly here. So this is, it, th this request here is an addition to what P1 currently has, okay? So we're not saying that the allocate, that the new allocation for the fourth part of this question uh, for process one should end up being 2122. Two, two. We're saying that that the new state that's being proposed is this plus what it currently has allocated. Okay. That's that's the way the textbook does it. So you know again this is this is a new uh, resource allocation request. These are in addition to what P1 currently has. Okay. So the actual new state uh, would be that that's that's being proposed is for P1 to have two uh, one plus one so two two uh, three, three. All right. So if it has two, 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 three, three, its needs would go down by two, one, two, two. Right. So one thing before you determine if the state is safe or not, show me again, the complete allocation and need matrix. The, the, the claim matrix shouldn't change. Oh, and the uh, available vector as well. So, so really for the new proposed state, you should show me the, the new allocation and the need um, although, you know, again, the allocation, the need will basically be the same, except 
uh, the allocations for P1 would change and the needs for P1 would change, but all the rest of them would stay the same, right? But also the, the it's also another very important thing is that you have the available resources correct after the proposed additional allocations, right? So you really should show me all three of those, the update, the, the new proposed allocations, um, um, are availables, um, allocations, and needs in the system, right? So then once you have that new proposed state, then you can do the same thing that I just talked about for three, okay? So given that new, new proposed state, um, is that new proposed state safe or not? Can I find a sequence of process ex um, executions where each process, where all five of the processes run to completion um, safely, right? If there is such a sequence, then that new proposed state is safe and it would be granted by the, the RAD or the banker's algorithm. And if we can't find a sequence, so if, if no process can run to completion or if we run one or two processes, but we get to a point where, where then some processes can't run to completion, uh, then, then, that safe, then that state would not be safe, right? All right, um, so I'll wrap up. I uh, haven't had anybody join me here, but uh, we'll see. If, if you have questions about the um, second problem set, let me know. Right, but but you know, make certain that you are doing these as adding these to the current allocation. So these are in, in addition to the current allocation, right? Um, so yeah. Anyway, you know, kind of just as a, a final random thought, the um, the the reason why this works as a deadlock avoidance is as long as you keep the the current state safe. So every time a new state is proposed, you don't um you don't grant that request if that new proposed state would be unsafe, right? So as long as you keep the current state safe, that guarantees that that a circular chain of, of processes, you know, which, which means that there's a dialogue can't happen because basically you're keeping it in such a, a way that the needs uh, could never be um, um, not met um, by the, the current available resources by, by doing this sort of check here. So. Um, all right, so I'm going to wrap that up. Um, let's go ahead and move on. I'm going to move on to the, the the third program assignment. I think people will find the third program assignment um, easier, but uh, than than the second one. Um, but before I do, um, I want to wrap. I want to look a, a little bit at the um, uh, previous assignment. So I think I mentioned briefly. I, I didn't quite get everybody's assignment to grade posted. Uh, I'll probably finish that up today here. Um, um, not a lot of people had the extra credit. Um, so I want, I want to just show a little bit about running the simulations that we're creating on the system uh, in case you don't kind of understand what we're doing here. Uh, and then showing kind of the, the thing you needed to do for the second assignment in order to get the uh, extra credit, in order to get all the system tests to pass. Um, because there is a requirement that you, that you do some things to get the system test to pass for the um, assignment three, all right? So um, if um, if you get all the tasks done um, and your code is building cleanly um, and you know if, if all of the unit tests in the assignment two tests are passing, however you run them, either using the control shift T to run them from the command line or using our test runner um, to run them, right? So, so if everything is passing, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that the system test will be passing. There, there might be uh, more stuff that needs to be done, okay, which you had to do uh, in this assignment, all right? So um, if you weren't aware of it, the whole purpose, let me, let me rebuild these here. The, the whole purpose of these, uh, the, the five programming assignments we're doing for this class is to end up with a, simulator, a simulation of some aspect of the operating system. So in this case, a simulation of doing um, process management and keeping track of the set of processes and moving them through the, the basic uh, three or five states, however you want to think of those. So ready, running, block mostly, using a round robin scheduling um, scheduler dispatcher, right? Um, so our um, um, projects always build two executables. So one of those is, is the unit test executable, just called test. But the other one is an actual sim 
um, uh, which is the simulation to run, okay? So if you weren't aware of it before, um, in our assignment uh, in the source, um, there's a, the assignment one tests, that has all that. That's probably what you're you're you're, mo you're pretty familiar with this by now. That has all the um, the, the 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 test framework um, and all these assertions that are being checked. Um, but there's another file um, always in these assignments called assignment whatever dash sim. Okay, so this actually has a uh, a main function, um, and this is an example of a program that's meant to be run from the command line. So these simulations are all command line tools, okay? So in this case, if you've never um, used like the command line arguments in C um, or other programming languages, what we're doing is um, we're gonna be parsing these command line arguments in order to pass in information to run our simulation with, all right? So arg C refers to the argument count and arg V refers to the argument values, okay? So very simply, what you can think of this is, um, so, so let's look Let's look at this. So basically what happens if arg count is not equal to three, we just print a usage message. And that, that's coming from this usage um, function here. All right, so you can run um, uh, these simulations by hand. If you open up a terminal, you have to put the dot slash to specify the path because our current directory isn't in the, the path normally and for how we run stuff. So if you do dot slash sim, if you don't give it the, the right number of arguments, which is three here, you get the usage message, which is coming from here, right? So what this is saying is that to run our simulation, there need to be three command line arguments. Uh, the name of the program is considered one, okay? So there's really only two besides the name of the program, sim. So you have to also give the time slice quantum. So if you remember for assignment two, uh, this was the, the number of um, steps uh, before we timed out a process and returned it back to the ready queue. So this was like the system time slice quantum. That, that should be the first command line argument. Uh, and the second one is one of these input files. So, so you probably saw examples of these. So, so we're using these for testing. So the dot sims are the things that we use as input. Um, and in this simulation, it's just the events that occur that we're trying to simulate, you know, so a new process being created, some CPU cycles, um, and then, you know, um, a process becoming blocked, waiting on some event 83 and becoming unblocked, process finishing, and so on, right? So, um, um, so before I show this being run, let me go back. So, so, so maybe that will help you understand what the argc and the argv are, right? So if the argc is not equal to three, we print out the usage message. If it is equal to three, that means um, that we've, we've given three command line arguments. So the name of the program, so I gave three good command line arguments here. The name of the program is sim. Uh, this is at this is at command line argument zero or argv zero. So argv has the value. So argv zero would just be the name of the program as we um, invoked it to execute it. Argv one and two. So for you know this is zero based indexing. So argv has three values in it, um, and the value to index zero is the program name. You can think of these as just regular strings, basically. Although it's using old style C arrays of characters to do these. So. Um, so anyway, argv0 um, should have the time slice quantum. So right, we're not doing a lot of error checking in this, uh, this little simulation command line tool here. We assume that we can convert the second argument, the one at index one, uh, from uh, an ASCII, you know, a regular, uh, an old style C character string into an integer. So ASCII to integer converts uh, an old style C character array into an integer. Right. So if, if I didn't give it an integer, probably something would happen there um, um, that would crash my program if, when if ASCII to integer couldn't correctly convert that. Um, and then the third one, uh, we just convert from the old style character array into a new C++ string, right? So and this needs to be the name of, of a simulation file, you know, um, one of these that has input in the format expected for the simulation, right? And again, notice I have to use like the path, you know, so relative to my current location, the simulation file I wanna run is in the sim file subdirectory and it's called process01events.sim, right? So that's the one I'm gonna run for the simulation. 
Um, so anyway, if you give it the command line parameters, it basically does a lot of the same stuff that, that you may or may not have seen happening in the test, okay? So we, we create a, an instance of a process simulator called sim again, like we did in the test. Um, and our process simulator um, constructor took a single parameter, um, which was the, the system time slash quantum. So we pass whatever the time slash quantum in um, uh, when we create this instance that was specified in the command line, right? Um, and then we call the run simulation. Method. So pretty much all of our simulations for assignments has something like a run simulation or um, um, something similar to that, uh, that's expecting uh, a file of input um, that needs to be simulated for, for whatever thing we're simulating, right? Um, we do minimal error checking. So, you know, some of the, you did have to throw some exceptions for some of the um, the, the thing, for some of the, the methods for assignment two. So here, you know, we, we check that, um, that you throw, if, if it does throw an exception, we catch that. Um, and uh, kind of note that happening. Um, all right. So the, the upshot of that, though, you know, so uh, if you've never done things like building a command line program or parsing command line arguments, I would encourage you to kind of take a look at this a little bit and understand this is useful kind of stuff to know here. Uh, but yeah, the short of that is that uh, you can run full simulations by hand, right? So if I want to run um, that set of events with a time slash quantum of five, um, I can invoke the program like that and it will um, actually run it. So it'll call the run simulation, um, load in the run simulation, loads in the, the events for the simulation one by one and executes them. You know, So if you implemented all the things that you needed to the, the done event, the block event, and so on. It's using those things you implemented um, to run the simulation one by one, you know, to run each of these events one by one. Um, so, you know, right, you, you can run simulations with different time slash quantums, different sets of events, create your own set of events if you wanted to, you know, uh, see what happens if, um, these events occur in the sequence for processes being managed in this round robin fashion, and so on, right? Um, all right, so to, uh, to wrap this up, because I do want to uh, just, I'm, I'm just going to only just get started talking about assignment three here today. But um, a final thing here to get this full, um, to get the unit test working. Um, so, you know, you can run all the unit tests by doing um, make unit tests from the command line. Um, uh, sorry, make, make uh, you can run all the system tests by, by running make system tests. Uh, the make system test is really just running the script file. This is basically running um, simulations uh, from the uh, terminal. Um, so it might be worth describing this a little bit. So what, what these do is, for example, it runs the simulation, um, let's say, for the process event 01.sim with a time slash quantum of three. So like this, uh, time slash quantum of three for the um, the the 01 sim, right? So it does that and um, it, saves the output into a file called uh, output slash process event 01 q03 dot out okay um, So, so you know, if you've never looked, seen command line redirection, this is just uh, so normally all this output goes to standard output. This re redirects the standard output into a file, right? So you get all of your output um, in this um, this file dot out file, right? Which is the result of running the simulation. So really, all the simulation, uh, all the system test does is compare that your output from running a complete simulation matches exactly the expected output. So these dot result files excuse me, in the sim files um, is the, the output. So it's really just doing a diff between um, uh, 
the the expected result um, from from wanting the full simulation and um, Oh, I put that in the wrong directory there. So, so normally when we run these system tests, it puts it in the output directory. Um, I put I put that in the sim file. Didn't really mean to do that. So yeah, that's why that's there. Um, but but yeah, so so it, it really we're just doing a difference between that and um, and the output from the simulate running the simulation that you implemented, right? So normally, if there's no diff, it won't report anything, right? And that means that you passed the system test. But, you know, if you had a mistake um, and if um, for some reason, like, um, make sure I got the right file here, for some reason, you still had the, um, the state as new for uh, at the very first step when the first process was created, um, if you do that diff, you'll see now it has a diff. So on line 14, um, this first one is from the, the first file here. So, so the, the system test was expecting that your output would say that the process was ready, but your output was showing that it was new. And, and that would fail that system test if, if you had a difference like that, right? Um, So um, just to wrap this up, because I do want to talk a little bit about assignment three. Um, so for this previous assignment to get the um, oh, system test to pass, well, for one thing, uh, you did have to take a look at the run simulation. Um, so in particular, um, all these things were commented out because uh, the, the code wouldn't compile until you actually implemented dispatch, new event, CPU event block event, unblock event, done event, um, and the timeout here, right? So, so you first have to uncomment all those. And, and, and once you uncomment all those, you should have been able to run simulations from the command line by hand, right? Because because those uh, are the hooks to invoke your function, right? So and, and again, if you, if you didn't look at this run simulation, uh, I encourage you to, to see if you can understand kind of what's going on. So, you know, these are all, th these simulation functions are all usually pretty simple, you know, so we basically open up a, a file of input events for the simulation with a little bit of error checking to make certain that if it doesn't open correctly, we just uh, throw, a, throw an exception, right? But assuming it's open, basically all we're doing is we're reading in the file line by line. So this while loop reads in each, each so, so each time, uh, we do this input stream, we're getting one line um, from uh, one of the dot sim files. So the first time we do it, we're going to get new uh, in here, right? Uh, and then it's, it's, it's just a big switch. So we always check if we can dispatch something, but after that, whatever the event is of the simulation, if it's new, we call the new event um, member method. If it's a CPU, we call the CPU event and so on, right? And we always try and dispatch before if the CPU is idle. Um, and then after we do a cycle, we always check if we need to do the round robin timeout, right? Um, so there's a little bit of output here in the run simulation. That's where um, this information is coming from, what the current system time is. So, so if you look at this, uh, what the event was that we just read on this cycle comes out first. Um, and then um, um, if it's a block event, we also output the, the event ID. Um, and uh, oh, I guess the rest of this then comes from the, um, um, from here. So by outputting this, this ends up calling the, the two string method here. Uh, because basically, uh, this is an instance of um, our process simulator, um, and we've overridden the um, uh, the output stream operator to call our two string method. Right, so that's kind of how that all works. Uh, but, but that makes it nice so that you, we can just use the output stream operator, uh, and ultimately it ends up invoking the two string. Right, so this is where the rest of the stuff comes from. This the simulation time, time slash quantum number of actions. So this is just an output of the state 
of, of the system currently. Then you also, to get the, the system test working, you had to, to um, um, add in a little bit to the two strings. So you had to add in um, that, um, 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 what the state of the process was here, all right, so whatever, if, if the CPU is currently running, we output um, what is currently running um, uh, on the system. And then you also had to output all the processes on the ready queue and all the processes on the blocked list here, right? So, um, you know, so if there's one process ready, you know, you should have had it shown on the ready queue and so on, right? So here you might wanna look, when I post this example solution, you might, might wanna look at this, so, you know, you had to use the maps that I had for the process control block and the blocked list. Uh, the 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 um, the, the ready queue is just a regular li um, list, right? So, for example, you can easily iterate over. It's a list of PIDs, so you can iterate using a value value based iteration in C plus plus to get each process identifier, um, access it out of the um, process control block, um, and stream um, that process information out. To standard output, or well, out to the output stream that we're supposed to be streaming to here. Um, likewise, for the uh, block list, it was a map between event IDs and um, process identifiers. So, if you wanted to output, uh, you'd have to get the process identifier in that mapping uh, and output that, like we did here. But uh, since it's a map, so here's an example of iterating over the map. So if, if you iterate over block list, you get uh, key value pairs, right? Key value pair is really just a STL type. It's, re it's really kind of a structure. There, there's like two member uh, member fields of one of these uh, pairs in, in, in an STL pair. There's the dot first, which is the key, and dot second, which is the value, which I don't really think those are great names. I don't know why they didn't, didn't just call it like dot key and dot value which would be more conventional, but um, anyway, that's how they defined it, right? So, so here, since, since the block list was a mapping between the event ID to the process identifier, the event ID is the key or the first, and the process identifier is the second uh, in that pair. So we can extract out the second to get the PID, look that up in the process control block, um, and output that process that's currently on the blocked list, right? Um, all right, so let me um, let me wrap that up. Let's go ahead and uh, just get started on, on assignment three. I'm, I'm only going to just describe stuff. Uh, actually, I mean, as usual, um, uh, let's go do task one uh, quickly, and then I'll just talk a little bit. And we can talk a little bit more uh, detail uh, if people have questions on the other tasks. Um, so let me go ahead and close this off. Oops. As usual, um, I'll go ahead and um, actually just open up a folder on my my local system because I always have problems um, if I don't start from uh, closing a file that was open on my local system. So let's go ahead and close that folder. All right, so um, I haven't done any of these steps yet to create the assignment. So let's, let's find the assignment three, make sure all the stuff is working as usual. I'm going to close my textbook off. I don't think we need that again. So we'll go ahead and accept assignment. Today. Like I said, um, it looked like at least six or seven people um, have already accepted um, so far, which is good. Um, once you accept it, it should create the repository on GitHub for you, which will give you the URL that you need to clone via the, the SSH URL that you should clone. So I'll go ahead and copy that. 
And we'll go ahead and clone a repository into a local folder first. <clears throat> I'll clone to my repos subdirectory. And we'll go ahead and open that folder. This is, this is open on my local file system, uh, but it should detect that there's a, a dev container so I can reopen it in the dev container. This is, this is the first time you've opened it. You shouldn't have all this stuff open. Um, but um, I'll go ahead and check that um, everything's building and running. The clean build. So in this assignment, um, um, there is one initial test case that, that will be uncommented. So you, you're, the first one that you're doing, you'll have to skip past this. So um, I can't remember, but yeah, I, I think that in the previous assignment, I, I already started doing this. So I removed the the defines or undefines right before each test case, like we did before. Um, and um, um, oh, and um, you know, maybe it's always a good idea to check that um, your IntelliSense is working. So here, I mean, it should identify, you know, X and Y are. Uh, um, undefined, and if I do a save, um, it should be running the code style formatter, so re-indenting the code and everything. Um, um, that's kind of a minimal sort of check, but you should be seeing all those things. Um, um, and then finally, you know, um, if you go through the checklist I normally have, you know, if we want to work on task one, we should go ahead and uh, create the task one issue and associate it with our pull request. All right. Um, and for that first commit, I mean, it should be, it should always be, you know, whether you do it on your local system or you look at the GitHub workflow, it should always be successfully compiling, successfully building um, and um, uh, running the test, but uh, the, the test will be, <laughs> many of the tests won't be running, it won't, won't be doing anything um, yet. Uh, usually the system test should be run on these assignments, but they'll be failing initially, of course. So. Um, all right. So we're going to be implementing the banker's algorithm uh, this time. Um, so like like I mentioned, I, I think this assignment is probably uh, a bit easier for most people than the previous one. Uh, there's certainly there's only like four or five tasks to do here, uh, a little bit less to do. Um, so the the basic thing that's happening here, so if we look at the input files for the simulation, you're basically given um, uh, the state of a system and we're gonna implement the functions in order to determine whether the state is safe or not, right? So we're implementing the banker's algorithm here. Um, so, you know, to describe these input files, this is actually the same state from the example, uh, the 6.7, uh, and the state is safe, right? So, so the first line is the number of processes, the number of resources. So in that example, we had four processes and three resources, okay? So the columns are always gonna be um, the resources and the rows are always gonna be the processes, okay? And we're, always, we're gonna be using zero-based indexing. So that might be a little bit different from our textbook. So, but, but yeah, for, um, so this is the total resources. We've, we've got nine of resource zero three of resource one and six of resource two, okay? Uh, and then the next we have the maximum claim matrix. So for process zero, the first row is process zero, um, has, has a maximum claim of three of resource th zero, two of resource one and uh, two of resource two. 
right? Two resource table, right? And this is for process one, process two, and three, right? So for, for a system with four processes, they're numbered process zero th to process three, right? And this is the allocation matrix, right? That's all the information you need for the state. You can infer the current allocations from, um, uh, the, you can infer the V, the current available, from the, um, al the, the total minus the allocation, right? So since I've currently got, nine allocated of A and there's nine total, that means there's zero available of, uh, I shouldn't say A, of, of resource zero, right? So resource zero, there's, there's zero available. Uh, resource one, I've got two allocated. Again, looking at the column, that's that's for resource one. There's two allocated, um, and so that means there's one available, right? Likewise, you can calculate the need matrix. This is done for you in the system. So, so the, the need, for example, for um, process zero, it claims it needs 322, it has 100, zero, zero. that means that it needs 222. Two, two. It needs two of resource zero, two of resource one, and two of resource two, all right? Um, so in this assignment, you're gonna be implementing stuff in the state.cpp. Um, I, I think also this is simpler. I, I don't think you have to actually add anything to the state.hpp file. Uh, I guess you didn't really have to in the previous assignment either. Um, but um, let's look at the header file for our state. Uh, maybe this isn't a great name for a class, but basically we're thinking of this as the, the state for, uh, for the banker's algorithm. So one of those states, um, and then we're going to implement the, 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 a safe method to return true if the state is safe or false if it's not. Okay? So the main thing in the state, besides the, you know, the number of resources, the number of processes for the state, uh, are a bunch of, we, we just went back to using regular uh, um, C arrays. So we're using one and two dimensional arrays. So for example, we've got the um, resource total, which is just a, a one dimensional array. Um, this is gonna get read in the, um, the values um, for from here. So 936 will be in the um, uh, resource total, right? Uh, we're, we're just using statically allocated arrays here, so we're doing something simple. So, so if you look at the top, there's max processes defined as 20 and max resources. What that means is that we will never be able to run simulations with more than 20 processes or 20 resources. And when you instantiate an instance um, of a state class, uh, it creates, like for example, this resource total, it creates an array big enough to hold 20 but we might only use like like if the number of resources is three, we only use the, the first three values in resource 20, which, which is like which is what we're doing like for this state. You know, since we had three resources, <coughs> even though it allocates um, uh, these arrays big enough to hold 20, we only use the first three resources. So, so the resources at index zero, one, and two, right? So the, the resource total at index zero should end up being nine. That, that was the total resources for resource zero. And the, the resource total at index one should be three. And the resource total at index two should be um, the, um, the six, all right? Um, and then we use two-dimensional arrays to, to read in the claim matrix and the allocation matrix. So again, you know, just, just be aware that we're always using the first index, which is the row, to index the process, right? And then the second index, which is the column of, of a two-dimensional um, array, you know, so if you think of this as a table, by convention, we usually think of the first index as indexing the row into the table and the second as indexing the column into the table, right? So, you know, again, if I wanted to access, let's say, what the, the maximum claim is for resource, for process one, resource two, I would use one, two, uh, so one for the process number, two for the resource number, right? Um, and um, the, the claim for process one is in row one. So this is row zero, row, row, row one. This is column zero, column one, column two. So for process uh, one, resource two, its maximum claim is three, right? Using index one for the row, for the first index, and index two for the column. And, you know, you do have to be careful, you know, so make certain that you're always using like number of process, the, the correct number of processes and the, the correct number of resources, right? So if you index past the end of these arrays, 
So if you go to a column that's, that's bigger than um, two uh, in this state or, or a row that's bigger than three in the state, you're actually you know, doing a bounds error. You're accessing the array beyond the end of the bounds and that can cause your program to crash mysteriously. So you have to be careful about doing that kind of stuff. Uh, oops. Um, So anyway, we have the, the claim, the allocation matrix, and also the need matrix, the resource total, the resource available. Those all get loaded in for you. So uh, when we load a state from the, the file, like this .sim file, those will get loaded. So those arrays will have all those values in them that you need to implement um, the functions, all right? Um, so like I said, um, 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 I'm just going to show you real quickly um, uh, getting started on the first um, task. There's only four tasks. The, the four tasks are to implement four member functions. The first three member functions are going to be reused by the fourth one to determine if the state is safe or not. Okay. So we implement a member function, first of all, uh, to determine if the needs are met or not. Right. So we're going to use that to determine whether for a particular process. So for needs are met, we return, we, we pass in a, a process number zero um, or one or two or three. So in this case, we're loading that state I was just showing you, the, the state one. And that had four processes, number zero, one, two or three. So what we ask is given that this is the current available, we pass that in separately. So for these functions, um, just as an aside here, we're not using the um, the resource available. So that was the initial available resources. But as we're running the simulation of the banker's algorithm, we're going to be releasing resources back. OK, um, so the current available might be bigger than than the initial number of resources that were available at the start uh, when we first define what the current state was of the system. Right. So, um, so that's why we pass that in because later on, uh, when when a process when we simulate it finishing, we're going to release its resources to this current available so that we can check if another process these needs can be met. Right. Um, so anyway, the, the the needs are met takes a process identifier or a, an index, uh, and this current available and it returns um, true. If those if that processes needs can be met from those current available and returns false if 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 they can't be right so notice that only process one's needs can be met from this initial state right um, and you know you can verify that for yourself so if, if we look at the state here it might be easiest to go ahead and figure out what the needs are although you shouldn't save this um, so I'm going to add in what the needs are the 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 um, um, the code um, um, calculates this for you, but but the needs is, is C minus A. So, so uh, process zero needs uh, two, two, two. Um, process uh, one needs, uh, um, so zero, zero, one. Uh, process three needs that minus that. So it needs one, zero, three. And uh, process, process three needs, um, um, that minus that, so it's four two zero. So those are our needs. All right. So the needs are met are basically um, given a current available of um, of um, we're, we're starting with a current available of zero one one here. Uh, we need to determine um, the, the first call is to determine if process zero's needs can be met with that available. And they can't because it needs two of resource zero and there's only zero, right? Um, and in fact, you know, that's quickly why why process uh, two and three also, you know, uh, needs can't be met because it needs, they both need a resource zero and there's none of resource zero. The only one whose needs can be met are process one that just needs one of resource uh, two. Um, and there is one of resource two, right? So, um, 
So I won't implement it for you, but um, the, the the pseudo code kind of for needs are met. Um, I guess I didn't give like this the pseudo code like I did for most of the others. But basically, what you need to do is, given the particular process you're asked to check if its needs are met or not by the current available, you check each resource one by one. So you need a loop that goes over the resources from zero to the number of resources. Um, and if you find any resources resource whose current available um, is less than the need, then you return false, right? So as soon as you find a resource uh, whose needs, uh, whose current available is less than need or whose uh, need is greater than uh, the current available, however you'd like to think about that, uh, you return false, right? If you check all the resources and they all can be met, then at the end you return true. So that, that would be how you would kind of implement the needs are met. Um, so, you know, now that I uncommented these, this won't compile unless uh, you do need to add in your function here. Um, so, um, oh, I, I, I was wrong. Um, you do have to add stuff to the header file and you'd had to do that on the previous assignment as well. So in this case, The needs are met function uh, returns a boolean result true or false true the needs are met or false they're not <laughs> it takes a simple um i probably should have like i did in the previous assignment it, it takes really a simple identifier of a process number but this is really an index into the row of our table of, of one of the two-dimensional tables all right so, so it takes um uh, the, the process index um, as the first value, 0, 1, 2, 3, if we have four processes, and it takes an array of integers, um, which is, you know, we can think of that as a vector, um, a, a one-dimensional array of the current available resources, right? Um, and whereas we expect if we've got three resources in the system, the current available should have, be keeping track of the number of the current available of each of those three resources, right? All right. Um, so yeah, we shouldn't really be modifying that current available, although I might not have made that as an additional requirement in the assignment. I probably should have. Um, but also the needs are met shouldn't be changing any of the variables or anything in the state. So it, it could probably should be a constant member function, right? But anyway, th that's the basic signature though. So we take a regular int and an array of ints as input and we return a Boolean result, right? Um, Now, in this assignment, I did not give you the function documentation. Um, it's a requirement, as I've been saying to some people, that, that you always have function documentation, okay? So you do have to put in uh, properly formatted function documentation here, right? So properly formatted function documentation has a slash followed by two stars. So this is how Doc Oxygen, um, uh, this is how um, our tool that, um, creates reference documentation knows that this is supposed to be uh, something that's parsed to create the reference documentation for the function that follows it, right? So you have the two stars. Uh, and then we should have a brief description. Um, so like I did here, um, go ahead and follow the same format. So use brief, this should be like a one to four or five word description of what the function does. Um, so I don't know, I, I, I get, I think of this more like a title. Um, and then have a fuller description. So, so test if the needs for the indicated process can be met with the currently available number of resources. Um, so, so this should be like a title, uh, but this should be a at least one sentence or more description. So that's kind of a minimal description there. And then you also have to document all parameters. So there should always be uh, one param at param that's an at sign. It has to be at param. 
um, put, put a blank space between the description and uh, documenting, not, not a blank line, but a line with just a star between the description and documenting the um, parameters and also a blank between the title um, and the description. <laughs> So you should give the 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 name of the of the um, parameter um, and then again you should have one or more sentences of description so so this is the index of the process identifier of the process that we will check if it's needs can be met or not right uh, and then uh, this is an array of resources um, of the count of the currently available number of each resource in the system. This array should be should be the same size as the num resources uh, number variable. Uh, and then finally, uh, if it's a value returning function, you should have a, re a return statement. Um, um, I'm used to the I'm, I'm used to the uh, uh, um, Visual Studio Code actually parsing the doc action, and I don't know why it's not getting the at param tags there. Uh, I think at return or returns are both valid tags. I, I, I should probably be consistent. I, so I sometimes use one, sometimes the other. So um, uh, anyway, so to finish this off, uh, you should put the type that's being returned here. So we're returning a Boolean result. Uh, and then again, a, a, at least a one sentence description or more. Use actual sentences. So, you know, that means capitalization, period or other punctuation, um, so on. Um, so this returns uh, true if the needs can be met for the process by the currently available resources. False if they cannot be met. Okay, so anyway, I mean, you do have to have that that function documentation um, for all the the four or five functions you're supposed to write for this assignment, right? And it needs to be properly formatted. So you know, it needs to have the two stars, it needs to have a brief description, a longer description, um, and every parameter needs to be documented um, correctly. And the return value, the function, if it returns a value, needs to be documented, right? And use use proper English sentences with initial capitalization and periods um, or other punctuation. Uh, and as usual, I'll just make a, a stub function here. Oh, and um, um, yeah, this is a this is actually a member function of our state class. One thing. So this is a member of the state class. So that should have a lot of people come back in the um, And that's our signature for them. Uh, just a second. Okay, uh, might be having some audio problems. Hopefully, this is still the audio is still working there. So, um, so if you get that signature in there correctly um, and that stub function, um, that should be enough then to um, um, be able to run the test. Although, so since we're pass, since we're returning false, it's only gonna it's gonna pass these, but it's gonna fail the one where it should be returning true there, right? So. Um, I'm going to do a clean build here just to make certain everything builds. <clears throat> uh, we'll try to make certain our tests are running here. And there we go. Right. So it's failing that one. So, like I said, you know, the, the implementation for the needs are met is, you know, you need to check every resource. You know, so if I pass in process one, 
you need to check the current available uh, for each resource against the, uh, the need matrix for process one. So you have to access that row. Uh, return false if you ever find a need that's greater than the current available. Uh, and if all the needs can be met, you need to return true on that, all right? Um, and then, um, uh, let me just, just mention, so, so there's just three more tasks. Uh, the, you'd have to do a little bit for the system test here. Maybe I'll talk about that on Thursday. So um, the find candidate process, um, you're required to use the needs are met. So basically this method is gonna be the first one that's used in the safe. So it's gonna be the main one that's used in the loop for the safe method uh, to determine if the, the, the total state is safe or not, right? So for find candidate process, um, <clears throat> You're going to be passed in. Let's, let's look at the uh, uh, the tests here for find candidate. So you're going to be passed in actually two arrays this time. So one um, is we're, we're going to be keeping track of which processes are completed or not. So again, you know this might not make sense until you understand fully how we do the safe state, right? So there's some notion about whether a process has actually been run or not yet while we're checking if a state is safe. So that's the first thing that's passed in. It's just an array of Booleans. It's false if it's not completed and true if it's completed. And then also we pass in the, the current available, um, which you're not really gonna be directly using in this function, but this is the same as what we had before for the needs are met. So, so this, should, th this should be the size of the number of processes in the system for the completed. There's four processes in the state one, and this should be the size of the number of resources. There, there's three resources, right? So for a fine candidate, um, basically you need to loop over all the processes this time, calling the needs are met um, and um, uh, for each process. And if you find a process whose needs are met by that current available and the process isn't yet completed, you're gonna return that process. So, so, so basically this, this function returns back an integer, a process identifier or an index, right? So initially from that first state, only process one was a candidate, even though, so even though none of the process had run yet, the only process that was, whose needs could be met initially was process one. So that's why process one was returned first here, right? But if we mark off process one as being tr completed, and we asked to find a candidate process, it should return back no candidate, okay? So, so you're only checking in your loop those processes that aren't yet completed. Um, if, so if it's not completed yet, then you check if its needs are met. If its needs are met, you return it. But if no process his needs can be met, um, it is both a um, not completed yet and, and needs can be met from the available resources, so if you check all processes and none of them are valid candidates, you return this um, defined constant, no candidate, which is like minus one, right? So, so the valid indexes are zero, one, two, three for processes, so, so no candidate, but, but do use the, um, the global defined con uh, constant, no candidate, to indicate a failure of the search here, all right? So that was find candidate. Um, and then release allocated resources um, is the last thing that you'll need before implementing the safe function. So basically what this does is th this simulates if we found a process whose needs could be met, uh, we're gonna simulate it running to completion. After it runs to completion, we, we want to add its allocated resources back to the current available. So that's what release allocated resources does. Is it just adds the resources for some process that just ran to completion uh, back to the, the current available vector, the current available array of resources, all right? So hopefully this is a relatively simple function. Um, So if you look at how it works, if our current available is 0, 1, 1, um, and we say release the allocated resources for process one. So process one um, is, is what is the only candidate process initially, right? So if we really release resources, so what we pass in for release allocated resources is the same as our first signature. It's the um, uh, just a regular integer, which is like an index or a process identifier, process number. 
um, and then an array of the resources, the current available comes in second. But in this case, uh, this is a void function. It doesn't return a result, but as a side effect, it, it uh, adds back in the uh, processes resources back to the current available. Okay, so before we called release allocated resources, its resources, the, the current available were 0, 1, 1. So we're, we're releasing the resources for process one here, right? So process one has allocated 6, 1, 2, right? So we have to add 6, 1, 2 to 0, 1, 1 to release the allocated resources for process one. Right, so six one two plus zero one one gives us six two three, right? And that that's what we checked here. Um, after we re release those resources, we have six two three now currently available. Okay, so again, this this function is a void function, but uh, so how it returns a result is by um, uh, modifying the current available. Okay, so in this case, unlike for the first one that I showed, you can't pass in this array as a constant array because you do need to be able to change. The value, add the values of the allocated resources back into the current available as a result of calling this function, right? Um, all right, and then finally, I'll talk more about the, the final uh, and also about doing the system tests um, on Wednesday. But finally, you're gonna use um, the functions that we did before to implement an is safe method. Okay, so is safe doesn't take any parameters as input and it returns a Boolean result. All right. So basically what is safe is going to be doing is given what the current state of the system is. So given the current values in the need, the claim matrix, um, 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 the, the number of total number of resources and so on, it returns true if that state is safe and false if it's not. Okay. So the signature is a little bit simpler here. No input parameters, just a Boolean result. Um, so the the um, the pseudocode, um, again, hopefully this is relatively straightforward. If you've been following this so far, we're going to be reusing the three previous methods, either directly or indirectly. <laughs> so you need to start by the, the resources, resource available uh, array. Um, has the, the resources that were available at the start of trying to determine if the state is safe or not. So we need to copy those into a different array that, that I've been calling like current available in, in all the tests, okay? So you could make your own loop or, or as a hint, there is a function called copy vector that you could use to do that. Um, and you also need a second array, an array of Booleans that keeps track of whether all the processes, wh which processes are completed or not, right? And uh, you need to initialize that correctly. So this needs to be the size of the number of processes. Um, and you need to initialize that so that all of them are marked false initially, right? So once you do that setup, then you can have a loop that simply calls find candidate process and keeps looping as long as find candidate process doesn't return no candidate, right? So if find candidate process returns um, a valid process identifier, zero, one, two, three, whatever. Uh, so if, if you find a candidate, you, you call release allocated resources to release the resources back to your current available for that candidate, that process that we just found. Um, and uh, yeah, that's it. Um, and, and you keep doing that in, until um, find candidate returns no candidate, right? But at the end, then the the determination if a state is safe or not is whether or not all the processes ran to completion or not, right? So the way you can tell that in this setup is by looking at the uh, that, that completed array of booleans, right? So at the end, if all of the processes are completed, that means they all ran, right, in some sequence. So, so if, if they're all completed, if all completed is marked as true, just return true. But if, if one or more are left as false, not completed, then you return false as your answer. Um, all right, so this, this has already been an hour and a half here. Um, so that, that should be a good start. I've got a couple more things to talk about. We can, we can go into more detail about implementing the safe. Um, and a few other things um, on Wednesday, but uh, but yeah, you should um, you know should get your problem set done here as soon as you can and get started on this assignment as soon as you can. 
Uh, keep sending questions. A lot of people are emailing me questions about things. Um, but um, that is it. I will go ahead and end this video and get it posted, and I'll see you guys later then.